know, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are right now. Uh, it's been a, a little bit since we've done one of these live streams. I've been uh, fairly busy lately. I uh, was on a, a bit of a, a break from YouTube because I was I, I somehow allowed a group of 24 high schoolers to talk me into taking them to Paris and Normandy. Uh, but anyway, had a, a great trip. Uh, kids learned a lot, you know, kind of passionate about education. So, so it was good to, uh, you know, get some kids on the ground and, and kind of spark their interest in history. Uh, but anyway, today, uh, talking about a topic that I think has largely kind of, pardon the pun, but kind of flown under the, the radar uh, when it comes to World War II history. A lot of people are familiar with Operation Overlord and Operation Market Garden, uh, but the, the last and largest airborne operation of World War II, Operation Varsity, if you were to talk to just any random person, they, they probably don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, anyway, today uh, I've got James Finland with us today, and he is the author of this book right here, Four Hours of Fury, the untold story of world, the uh, World War II's largest airborne invasion and final push into Nazi Germany. So I'm going to go ahead and bring James in right now. James, Thanks for uh, taking the time to jump in here and 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 help us learn a little bit more about uh, about this operation. Absolutely, thank you, JD, for giving me the time and the opportunity to chat with you. I've I've reported in with my history underground uniform on. I've got my baseball hat and plaid <laughs> shirt, so I'm ready to rock this morning. Absolutely, good to go. <laughs> so before we talk about varsity, uh, I'm kind of interested in in your background. Like, where where'd you grow up and um, I guess kind of what, what led you to your interest in the 17th Airborne? Sure. Yeah. So I grew up, I moved around a lot as a kid. I grew I was born up near uh, Chicago, Illinois. Not, I didn't stay in that part of the country very long. My family moved to Colorado. We were there for a couple of years, then moved to San Jose, California. As my dad got a job out in what was becoming at that time, Silicon Valley. Um, we then, he got transferred. We went, moved to Lubbock, Texas for a stunning six months and we were back in California and then we moved to Texas in the in the mid 80s I guess and uh, I've kind of been in Texas off and on since then I went to high school here and came back and went to the University of Texas in Austin as well my wife and I currently live out in the hill country outside of Austin um, and then in terms of kind of how I got interested in the 17th Airborne it really came out of my own um, experience of going to jump school um, in the late 80s. I enlisted in, in 88 and went to jump school in 1989, so a while back. But, um, you know, I was I was uh, a private in the Army, didn't have any money, well, didn't drink, so didn't have a lot to do on the weekends and spent a fair amount of time at the base museum. And, you know, just kind of like in your introduction, I had I was familiar with uh, Overlord and Market Garden in my my high school history class. You know, one of the cool things about that experience was he, uh, that instructor liked to bring in speakers. And at that time, you know, World War II veterans were a lot easier to find and get to talk to. And so um, I had a real avid early interest in military history. And it was while visiting the Post Museum at Fort Benning that I saw a note about Operation Varsity in the 17th Airborne Division, which isn't really anything that I had ever heard of or wasn't familiar with. Um, you know, fast forward now, several, you know, decade, 15 years later, I'm, I'm out of the service. I'm now uh, still, you know, feeding my hobby of military history. I'm collecting books is kind of my primary way that I uh, enjoy learning about that history. And in the, the whole time I'm doing this, the 17th Airborne is always in the back of my mind of, you know, I want to learn more about them. I want to read about Operation Varsity. And frankly, there just wasn't a lot a lot out there. You could find some information, you know, in chapters of other books that kind of had a broader history of the end of the war. Um, you know, Operation Varsity was was predominantly a British operation under the command of, of Montgomery. And so one day I was kind of complaining about this fact to my wife and she made the observation of, you know, instead of sitting around whining about it, for lack of a better word, why don't you actually write the book that you're looking for? And so 
Um, so, you know, I was fortunate. I got to interview veterans and four hours of fury was kind of my attempt at, uh, a Cornelius Ryan kind of expose of, of operation varsity. So I have had people uh, tell me from time to time, they're like, Hey, you should write a book. And I'm like, first off, I don't know what I would write about. And, and second, I, I don't know if I have the ability to write anything that would be more than like a trifold brochure. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, about the the writing process and and the research process can, can you kind of walk me through what that looks like sure yeah i mean i think it's it's to me that i kind of approached those for this book in, in parallel right and so is um you know i think the research piece the, the first component of it was you know again kind of going back to when i was writing the book in the early 2000s or i should say the you know the 2010s plus whatever you call those um, you know, I was able to go to veteran reunions quite a bit. And so I attended, you know, three or four veteran reunions for the 17th Airborne Division. I went to a couple glider pilot reunions as well. And so I think, you know, the primary research there was around just the, the, the fortune to be able to actually interview the guys that were there on the ground. Um, you know, I remember Don Penzel was a glider pilot that, that I had met and, you know, I don't, I'm not 100% sure, and I don't think he was either about what he was actually supposed to be doing once he landed on the ground, because what he did do was run around with his camera and take three rolls of, you know, film of, of the battlefield, essentially, right? And that kind of really, you know, further piqued my interest in it. And so it started with the veteran stories and then, you know, kind of the the spending lots of time in in the archives, right, up in, up in you know, the National Archives up in uh, Washington, D.C., I was fortunate to spend, I made, I think I made three or four trips to the National Archives um, outside of London, because again, it was a predominantly, you know, it was 21 Army Group operation. So most of the after action reports at, at the high level and all the planning were kind of all British documents. So that was kind of what informed the roll up and then the kind of the, the assessment afterwards. Um, the 17th Airborne Division documents are all in Washington, D.C., made a couple of trips to the Glider Pilot Museum in Lubbock, Texas as well to find some information there. And then it was kind of just a hodgepodge of, you know, reaching out to the Medal of Honor Society to kind of see what details they had about some of those events and just kind of really trying to, to burrow into these different, you know, facilities around the country to kind of find pieces and parts of information. Um, and then I guess as far as the writing aspect of it goes, I read a lot. And so I think yeah. that, you know, I've, there's a lot of authors who said this, so this isn't anything that I came up with, but if you want to write well, then, um, you know, it's recommended that you read a lot. And so I kind of spent time with Cornelius Ryan's a bridge too far and kind of reverse engineering some of how he handled, you know, the planning of the operation, the execution of the operation and things like that to kind of see how other authors had approached, you know, similar massive size operations to make it, consumable content. What, was there any other previous work that had been done on the 17th Airborne or Operation Varsity that, that you kind of built on or, or drew from? Or um, was it, I, I mean, because in my mind, like y your book is about the only one that I can think of that, <laughs> yeah. that has really touched on it in any kind of depth. That's right. And that's that's kind of the way I tackled it. And so the short answer to your question is no. I mean, there was a couple of, of self-published veteran books that provided additional content, but they kind of were, you know, focused in on their individual experiences. And so for me to kind of open up and, and examine the operation, I really had to start with, you know, as get as close to the original documentation as possible. Um, you know, the Army's got those green books, um, the name of the, that series, I can't remember what um, it's called, but they've got, it's, you know, there's a whole volume set of the ground war, and they certainly had one on the crossing of the Rhine. Varsity, again, was kind of treated just as a, almost as a subchapter to the wider operation of, you know, the U.S. Army focus, which was a little bit further south of the Rhine, where, where Patton ended up crossing near Remagen. Yeah, but certainly, you know, there was some follow on forces that ended up crossing the Rhine after varsity that were American as well. So I had some things to build on, but by and large, it was it was all based on period documents to kind of put it all together. OK, I, I wondered about that because, you know, as as I was reading your book uh, when you sent it to me, which thank you, by the way, I appreciate mm -hmm. you sending that to me when, when it came out. Uh, 
I, I, I would get to thinking about that. You, like you go to the military history section of the bookstore. I mean, you, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a book on Operation Overlord or D-Day or something like that. And and there's nothing on varsity. Uh, so I didn't know if there was any any prior work that, that you drew from. I, I want to get to the operation here in, in just a second. But one other element in your book that I think is commendable. And hang on, let me let me find it here. OK. Um, that, that people like me especially appreciate are the maps that you include. Um, I, I think, I think the, that your works and I've also got angels against the sun sitting here next to me as well. Like anytime I'm reading a, a military history book, it, it's hard for me to kind of visualize, you know, what's going on if, if I'm not already familiar with the area and, and your maps are second to none. And I think anybody who is endeavoring to write a military history book needs to use your work a, as a template. Uh, where, did, did you work with somebody in uh, the, the creation of the maps in there or, or how, what did that look like? Yeah. Well, first I appreciate your compliments on that because I, I agree with you, right? Maps are critical in my opinion for reading any kind of, of history, particularly military history, because so much of it is actually direct, you know, so much of the action, so much of the planning is based on the terrain. And so if you don't understand the terrain, why did they cross that part of the Rhine? Why did they need to seize that set of hills? Why was that canal so important? It all comes back to terrain. And so the maps were a vital component of it. It was also, uh, it, it got started for me with just, that's how kind of I approached and understood how the operation unfolded. It was, you know, going back into the after action reports, plotting the actual points on the ground from period maps and kind of better understanding, you know, what units were going where, how they got there. Um, and then to your, your point, one of the things that I learned um, as I embarked on my career as an author is, is that is if an author wants maps in the, in their book, the author has to pay for the creation of those maps that those those uh, are not something that is funded by the publisher right and so um, as you observed i think both of my books have a combined something like 24 or 26 maps in them across the, the two of them right i think 12 14 each something like that and so basically i created those maps myself so i learned how to use um, adobe illustrator um you know they're all um hand drawn by me as a way to um, to make sure that I could, I didn't want the price tag to stumble upon, you know, to prevent rather me from telling the story in those maps as much as possible, particularly when you're talking about something as, op, you know, huge as Operation Varsity, um, maps are a critical element of that. And I base them all on period maps. And so, you know, one of the more rewarding aspects of this, just to kind of, I don't know, maybe jump ahead or tell an anecdotal story is there's a guy in Belgium who's used some of those maps that I put in the book to go metal detecting. It was actually able to find a, a mortar position that I had put in one of the maps and actually uh, sent me like scrap metal from his excavation of like, your maps are so accurate. I found, you know, I actually found this yeah. gun position. And so that's been a very rewarding, uh, unexpected outcome from, you know, the maps. So in, in the research phase, did, did that include any trips over to the the battlefield and, and walking the ground? Absolutely, yeah. And that was one of the other rewarding components of it was getting to go to Germany. Um, you know, and like unlike some of the other battlefields you mentioned, Overlord and Market Garden, there are, uh, at least at the time I was doing this, there's zero monuments for, you know, reasons that you could probably assume. Um, and so exploring the battlefield there is really something that required a lot of preparation, a lot of map reconnaissance of comparing then and now kind of things to go check out. Um, but I was able to walk all the drop zones, both the British and the 17th Airborne drop zones. Um, as you probably discover in your own um, exploration of battlefields, I found that everything was a lot closer than um, I thought it was when I started. You know, it's a map, so you're trying, you're making some assumptions, but it's like no matter how much time you spend studying maps until you actually go walk the, the ground and the terrain and you realize like how close these drop zones are to each other and things like that. Um, so that, that was a great way to kind of help me wrap my head around things and pull it, pull it together. All right. Yeah. There, the, to me, there's nothing that replaces walking the ground. A uh, mutual friend of ours, Paul Woodage mm -hmm. uh, told me one time that if he's reading a Normandy book, 
uh, or book on D-Day or anything like that. He, he said, I can tell if the author has actually walked the ground and has been there uh, when when they've done their writing or if they've just looked at maps. I think we might have been talking about Lafayette at the time uh, okay. when, when he told me that. But all right. Anyway, let's, let's, let's get into to varsity. Uh, okay. maybe, maybe kind of set it up like what's going on with the uh, with, with the Allied forces and uh, maybe with the 17th Airborne in particular. Uh, sure. Right up to, to March of 45. Yeah, so I'll start with just kind of a very simplified overview. Just, you know, the Allies landed on June 6th in Normandy, as you know. Okay, this is a great reference. Um, so the Allies were basically pushing their way towards Germany, which I don't think is a surprise to anybody. Um, the Americans are there, you know, in those darker arrows to the south. Um, the British and French troops are, and Canadians are further north. They're pushing um, along the northern flank on their way into Germany. Um, slight setback during December of 44 with the Battle of the Bulge kind of puts everything on pause. The Allies resume their push in late January, February, and they're really kind of moving on this broad front to the Rhine River. And uh, the Rhine River averages about 400 yards wide. So that's, you know, roughly four American football fields. Um, so it's not an insignificant um, geographical obstacle, right? And so, um, you know, the approach there, again, as the Americans of the South, um, predominantly the British on the North, kind of also kind of showed a difference in kind of the Allied strategy at the time. The, the, the Americans were pushing forward, really hoping to uh, bounce the Rhine as a term, that they really wanted to push the Germans as quickly as possible to prevent them from uh, blowing up a bridge so that they could, they could get to the Rhine and get across it as, as quickly as possible. Um, I'm sure you and several of our viewers are familiar with the, the, the Remagen Bridge, which the Americans did succeed in getting that bridge before it collapsed a couple of days later. The British, specifically under uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, approached the Rhine River and then kind of came to uh, a pause there while then Montgomery started bringing up all of his logistics and started planning for what would become the largest river crossing in, in military history. Um, and, and it's fair to note here that the original plan, the original Allied plan, was to cross the Rhine River in Montgomery's sector, right? Because that was where uh, the terrain there is flatter. This goes back to our conversation about terrain. The terrain there facilitated a more uh, sweeping breakout. Um, the Allied plan at the time was to encircle the Ruhr industrial area in Germany and cut off that, that final um, you know, mechanized ability that they were continuing to crank out um, anti-aircraft weapons, even U-boats, tanks, aircraft. Now, you know, there's a strong argument around, did they have anybody to fly those aircraft or fuel for those tanks? But they were still continuing to build their weapons of war up, up in that area. And so the Allied plan um, in that sector was to kind of sweep around the Ruhr and cut it off. Um, Operation Varsity um, was the airborne component of Montgomery's plan to cross the, the, the Rhine River near uh, vessel up there at the top of the map. Um, the Germans were uh, holding that area under the command of a guy named Alfred Schlem, who was the commander of the first parachute army. Operation Grenade and Veritable were the two operations that were um, intended to do that final push, uh, you know, push the Germans back across the Rhine. Um, Hitler had declared uh, vessel to be uh, a fortress. This is one of those fortress terms, which was, I think I'm getting that right. If not, I'm sure somebody in the comments can correct me on what that official designation was. But it was this idea that, uh, you know, Hitler had in his mind that he was going to launch a counterattack to push the, you know, the allies back. Um, and he wanted the the pocket there um, identified on that map up near Vessel as the way that he was going to then recross the Rhine River to attack into um, the advancing British. Um, very much a pipe dream, and in, in late February, March of 1945, frankly, I, you know, I don't, I haven't studied the German side of that in depth, but I think it's highly unlikely that he was going to be able to muster anything to put a dent in the Allied advance at that point. And if you look at that kind of area up there around 5 March 1945, that is kind of the pocket area around centered on Vessel. There, there was two bridges at Vessel. 
Um, one was a railroad bridge and then one was a more standard, um, you know, vehicle foot traffic kind of bridge. Um, Schlem was ordered to hold that bridge as long as possible. There was a lot of uh, crazy Nazi stuff going on as far as, you know, what was mm -hmm. happening to guys who lost their, who lost the bridge that they were supposed to be holding. And so it was, uh, on the one hand, you could argue Schlem was fighting the allies to keep that pocket, um, you know, sustained on his perimeter, just as much as he was fighting the high command in Germany about how to get what fighting troops he had back across the river to um, hold off what he viewed as the inevitable allied crossing of the Rhine River. Um, the 17th Airborne at this time, they had been fighting in the Battle of the Bulge. They had sustained tremendous casualties, just like all of the Airborne divisions did um, in the Battle of the Bulge. They suffered about 4,000 casualties um, in January of 1945. They came into the Bulge around Christmas Eve in December of 44, fought through the Bulge until about mid-February, where they were pulled back from the lines to bases in France where they began um, reconstituting, pulling in replacements to uh, make up those numbers, those 4,000 casualties that they suffered. Of course, guys were coming back from the hospital at that point as well. They were going through uh, airborne training and preparing, um, albeit none of them really knew what they were preparing for, but they were going through airborne training in, in preparation for what would be eventually become Varsity. Now, in, in preparation for Varsity, it, 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 like each stage of, you know, the airborne stuff, you know, the allies are kind of, they're, they're kind of learning as, as they go and, and, and adapting. So like from Husky to Operation Overlord, there's the addition of the invasion stripes to keep us from shooting down our own planes. Um, you know, there's uh, some changes in gear and things like that from Overlord to, to Market Garden. What, what are some of the, the lessons that the allies have learned from Market Garden that they're going to be putting into practice going into varsity? Because, I mean, this is this is kind of Montgomery's show. And I would think from the American standpoint, there might be a little bit of trepidation where, you know, we're, we're basically on the heels of a, a, a failed Montgomery operation. What, what's going to make this one different? Yeah, it's a great question, JD, um, because that's that was one of the things that I really um, appreciated about being able to go back into the original documentation, particularly Ridgeway's 18th Airborne Corps diary it does a really great job of kind of capturing his concerns and how they were going to mitigate those concerns, having learned all these lessons, um, exactly as you mentioned. And I think later, you know, Eisenhower described Varsity as the best airborne operation that the Allies had executed during the war. And of course, that's that's all because of the lessons that were learned at a very high cost in the previous airborne operations. I think the first lesson, which was again, a, that they learned that they applied to Market Garden as well, was that they were going to drop during the daylight hours, right? It was still very difficult then to navigate at night for transport pilots. Um, they had air supremacy at this point, more or less. So var first and foremost, Varsity was going to be a, a daylight drop. Um, initially, General Miley of the 17th Airborne Division was opposed to that. He, he felt that he had more security um, dropping at night um, into um, enemy territory, but that was overruled, and he eventually got on board with the logic behind why that was going to be uh, a, a better plan. I think the other lesson um, directly from Market Garden that they applied was that it, everything in Varsity was going to be a single lift operation, right? So one of the things that kind of hampered market garden was this idea that when the troops jumped in, they still had to hold their drop zones in many cases so that additional lifts could be brought in. And so they weren't able to apply their full combat power um, to seize their objectives because they still had to have elements defending their landing zones and their drop zones. And so varsity was going to be a single lift operation so that everybody on the ground could move out and, and seize their objectives as quickly as possible. They're also using some different, like planes and and some different tactics and, and things like that. Can can you maybe talk about uh, some of the the adjustments that these guys are having to make, like with the C forty sixes? Because they're using C forty sixes in this operation, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, one regiment of the Seventeenth Airborne, the Five Hundred and Thirteenth Parachute Infantry Regiment, 
um, known as, you know, AKA the 13ers as they dubbed themselves, they kind of embraced that uh, 13 in their, in their unit designation. And this is a great photo reference because this really shows the benefits of the C-46. So thanks for pulling this up, JD. Um, C-46 was basically twice the size of a C-47. So I think the average um, stick size for a C-47 was about 18, you know, combat equipped paratroopers. And the C-46 here not only could carry almost twice that number, um, you can see here, if you look closely on the left, it actually had two doors um, in the fuselage, which allowed paratroopers to um, exit out both sides of the aircraft at the same time. Here's a great photo of these guys getting ready to jump. This was in uh, this photo, I think, is actually taken from the lead aircraft of the 513th as they're getting ready to jump into um, drop zone X for varsity. Um, but so not only could it hold um, twice as many guys, but it allowed them to exit twice as fast. And so they could come out of both doors at the same time. And how what that translates into from a tactical advantage is, is that allows these um, sticks of paratroopers to actually land closer together in, in greater numbers. Um, there are some disadvantages of the C-46, and we can talk about that um, later when we actually get into the drop itself. Um, the troopers had very mixed emotions, actually, though, about jumping in the C-46 because um, half the guys had to learn how to go out the opposite door from what they were used to, right? So they had been they had gone through jump school. All their jumps up into this time had been out of a C-47. They had all their their muscle memory of uh, ingrained as to how to, you know, shuffle forward and jump out the plane. And now some of them were going to be forced to go out the opposite side of the aircraft. And so, um, you know, there's pictures of, of guys where they pulled up deuce and a half trucks um, on either side of the C-46 and, and allowed guys just while the plane was sitting on the ground to kind of do rehearsals hmm. to get their exit procedures down. They did get one or two actual practice jumps out of the C-46 um, but they were doing what they could to help those guys get ready for that new experience. So, um, anyway. and so it was an advantage in that it, you know, again, it, it gave them that opportunity to keep training um, and, and become familiar with the, the difficulty of these guys kind of going in and out of those, those, those opposite doors. So there's a, a question here in the sidebar, and I do want to make a, a quick note here. I'm recording this in a place where there's an event going on today. So every once in a while they're making some announcements. So I'm having to mute my mic. So I, I apologize for that. Uh, but there's a question here in the sidebar uh, asking, are, are the paratroopers as loaded down with gear as on D-Day or is it a lighter load? It, have, have they made some, some changes from, from the, the June 6th drop? Yeah, Lisa, that's a fantastic question. And I, I like it because it kind of depends on who you're talking about, right? So one of the interesting components of the 17th Airborne was, of course, at this point in varsity, all of the division had combat experience um, through the Battle of the Bulge, but only one of the regiments, the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment had previous combat experience uh, in an airborne operation. And of course, that was when they were attached to the 82nd Airborne Division and had jumped into D-Day itself. And what's interesting about it is that the two commanders of the two parachute regiments actually had very different ways of looking at their airborne operation. And so um, the 507th under the command of Edson Raff jumped with a lot of combat equipment. And so he was a big fan of making sure that his guys were ready to fight as soon as they landed on the ground, he was a veteran of those earlier operations in North Africa. He had landed amphibiously in uh, Normandy um, before he became the commander of the 507th. So he had seen firsthand kind of the, the chaos of getting organized after an airborne operation. And so the 507th guys jumped in with their radios on, on them. Uh, they jumped in, in in many cases with their 30 caliber machine guns and specially modified bags kind of across their chest. Um, so these, the 507th was really weighted down with like almost all of their equipment. And we'll see how that kind of played itself out to their advantage when they landed in Germany. The 513th, on the other hand, um, took a more, uh, I'll say conservative approach for lack of a better word, but their radios and medium machine guns were all um, dropped in para bundles from underneath the aircraft. Um, they were still, you know, pretty, pretty uh, equipped up with heavy equipment, but the 507th had a lot more heavier equipment than the 513th did. All right. So 
I, I want to ask you about this guy right here, General. Uh, General, are you pronounce it Miley or Millie? Uh, Miley, I believe. Yeah. Miley. Okay. So no relation, by the way, to General Mark Milley, who was recently retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, so, so we hear a lot about like General Maxwell Taylor and Ridgeway and and Gavin. Uh, t- tell me a little bit more about the the man at the at the head of the 17th Airborne here. Yeah, I uh, I love talking about uh, Bud Miley. Miley was. Um, as you mentioned, he ended the war as the uh, commander of the 17th Airborne Division. And really, it's a shame that history has kind of overlooked him in his contribution to the American airborne effort, because it, it really begins with Miley. So Miley was the commander of the Army's first organized unit of, of parachute troops, right? So the test platoon kind of gets their credit and credit is due to them. But that organization was not a organized to be a fighting unit. That was a test platoon to determine the feasibility of dropping troops um, via parachute, right? Well, those guys kind of all joined what became the 501st Parachute Infantry Battalion, and Miley was the first commander of that battalion. And so it's a real fascinating uh, part of history, at least I, I think so, in 1941, before the United States had entered war, Miley is the commander of this battalion. He's the one that uh, kind of came up with uh, the need for a unique jump boot. Um, you know, he would he would set up his battalions to where in order to iterate quickly on testing new equipment, um, some battalions would be wearing different boots than other battalions. They would kind of give their feedback. They were wearing different uniforms. I'm sure you and the some of the viewers have seen the variations of the original jump uniforms. Um, so they kind of, the 501st was kind of responsible for dialing in some of that equipment that the later units used. And it was Miley who sent uh, Yarborough, later General Yarborough, um, but as a captain, Yarborough was dispatched to Washington, D.C. with the responsibility of coming back with a design approved by the War Department for uh, the parachute jump insignia that that is the same insignia still worn by uh, American paratroopers today. Um And the other thing that I find interesting is we kind of look at, you know, we look back at the generation that fought World War II and certainly reluctant hero is uh, a great way to describe many of them. Mm -hmm. There were also plenty of guys who looked forward to uh, jumping into combat, jumping in uh, against the Japanese or the Germans. And Miley was certainly one of those kind of warrior leaders, if you will. Um, He used to dismiss his men on Friday evenings with a fight speech. And basically his fight speech was, um, I don't care if, to have to, if I have to go bail you out of jail. I don't care if you come back with your uniform torn, your eye you know, blackened. I don't want to hear a single story about any one of you running from a fight or <laughs> leaving any of your buddies in a fight. And so it kind of, you know, he's kind of responsible, right or wrong, you could argue, for really invoking this sense of esprit de corps and uh, certainly a willingness to resort to fisticuffs as, as a first option uh, while out on the town for his guys. And, and I, I like how in this photo, like he's not only going to jump, but he's going to jump in style. I can see his tie. You know, <laughs> <all around. laughs> That's right. He's, That's a great point. Yeah. Nowadays, nice when, when I went through around. jump school, you weren't, you weren't supposed to have anything around your neck in, in the, in case it get, gets hung up on something. But back then, you know, you wanted to, you wanted to represent. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, maybe we can uh, kind of move forward to to the uh, to the jump on uh, on March 24th. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this. Yeah, this is a great way to go. So so uh, Miley there actually dropped into drop zone W. He was in the second echelon to drop in there. The first guys coming in were coming into drop zone W down at the south end of your map there. And that was the 507th led by Edson Raff. Um, you know, Raf's got an interesting story real quick. He, like I mentioned, he jumped into Africa in the first um, American airborne operation of the war. He was the first guy standing in the door. And then he closed out the war in 1945, again, as the first guy standing in the door um, of his C-47, because the 507th jumped C-47s. And he jumped into Germany um, as the lead trooper in his, uh, for his regiment. His, he and the, uh, an entire battalion of his regiment were misdropped um, just north of that drop zone W. They actually landed um, 
a little bit of ways near Deers Fort Castle, which was also an objective of the 507th, while the other two battalions landed in drop zone W. And I think this is where that equipment comes into play because what happened where when they when they landed in uh, DZW and that, that battalion dropped off, off the objective, um, because they had all dropped with their radios, RAF was able to quickly get on the radio once he had identified his location and reorganize his three battalions and redesignate their objectives because his one of his battalions had landed near Deers Fort Castle. He was able to quickly hop on the radio and let his battalion commanders know that they were engaging with somebody else's objective. That battalion in turn took over the objective of the other, which was not something that helped the 513th. Yeah, here's a great picture of Edson Raff. Um, he was 37 years old at the time that he was the regimental commander of um, the 507th. Uh, fa another fascinating character. He's one of these guys that you either loved or hated him. His nickname was Little Caesar. He loved to uh, bark orders around. He was known for basically bullying any officer that was taller than him, which uh, so he kind of had a very divisive reputation. Um, the men of the 507th were initially not thrilled that he had become their commander. Um, he had taken over the 507th not long um, uh, in France, not long after D-Day when the 507th lost their commander in, in Operation Overlord. They had wanted somebody from within the regiment to be promoted. Um, so Raff was kind of viewed as an outsider. Mm. And when they got back to England, he embarked uh, on, a, on a training regimen that the veterans who had come in from France were um, more than pissed off about because he kind of took everybody back to basics, basic marksmanship, basic unit tactics. Raff was a big believer in um, platoon size operations. And so really spent a lot of time with um, junior leaders, which, you know, the guys weren't used to the, the regimental commander doing that. But it really paid off. And, and, and in hindsight, after varsity, a lot of the guys changed their opinion of Raff because of his insistence that they jump with heavy equipment, his insistence that um, the platoon leaders have a much more engaged um, understanding of what the operation and what their objectives were. So he was he was a fascinating character. Um, and just as an aside, when he later um, took over 77th Special Forces Group after the war, they were known as the Apes of RAF. Just as a <laughs> an amazing <laughs> name, kind of a cool nickname for that unit. But um, but I, I, I do I, I do a lot of I'm kind of an outdoorsy guy and do a lot of hunting. And there's there's a, a saying in the hunting world, especially if you hunt out west, of uh, train hard, hunt easy. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, a, a lot of guys. You know, I, I can see where they would maybe hate a guy like that in the moment. Uh, but then when, you know, when, when it all hits the fan and, and the battle hits and, you know, you're, you're well trained, uh, you, you probably look back with a, a little bit different perspective uh, on guys like that, that that pushed them hard. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a great anecdotal story about, um, you know, most of the division staff did not like RAF because, um, Again, he was always, you know, <laughs> he loved to rub everybody's nose in the fact that he had more combat experience than they did, which is an important, you know, factor when you're in, in war. So he was, he was, you know, disliked because of that. And then also, but it was also interesting because there was a great story about when he, when he did that misdrop in varsity, there was a, one of his men kind of just watched him kind of take five minutes, sit down with his map and his compass and, you know, Raph sitting there while German mortar shells are coming in and he's just sitting there calmly looking at his map and, you know, quickly ascertained where he had landed and again, jumped on the radio and was able to kind of get his unit back into the fight. Um, the second unit coming in with the 17th Airborne Division was the 513th Parachute Infantry Regiment. These were the guys coming into those C-46s. Okay. They were coming into drop zone X. And I think I, I want to pause here just for a minute and, and recognize that while we are talking about the 17th Airborne Division, it was actually a two division airdrop. And you can, this is a great map to kind of show that the British 6th Airborne Division, um, the well known Red Devils from um, Operation Overlord, they had participated in that operation as well. They were responsible for 
um, seizing objectives to the north of the 17th Airborne Division. So just wanted a quick shout out that this was not just yeah. an American operation. We're talking about the 17th, which is the focus, but the 6th was in there as well. And basically, and these, these guys are all, uh, if you look there on the map there, basically, if, if I understand correctly, they're seizing bridges and preventing a German counterattack for the guys who are crossing the Rhine River. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point, JD. I guess we should have paused and actually <laughs> talked about what was trying to get accomplished here before we dump into everything. But yeah, that's a fantastic observation. And one of the reasons why, I mean, you had kind of you had kind of talked about how varsity had kind of flown under the radar. And, you know, I, I you know, the subtitle of the book is the untold story, <laughs> which, you know, some historians cringe at when you put untold in there. But at the time, um, nobody held, in this case, nobody it's literally really, it's, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But, you know, this is a great map because it, it is the objective here was to twofold. One, it was to seize these bridges, which are numbered one through 10 in the 17th Airborne Division sector. There were three more that you can kind of just see there at the top of the map that the British were responsible for seizing themselves. And this was um, a great way to make sure that these crossing points um, were seized before the Germans could seize them, because at the time, you um, ground forces are making their way across the Rhine River. And these bridges, they wanted to seize them for, for two reasons. One, they wanted to prevent the Germans from attacking across them into the developing bridgehead. And then also they wanted to seize them um, intact because the intent was that, you know, only a handful of these bridges could actually support the weight of advancing allied armor. So they wanted to make sure that they had seized those bridges that would then facilitate um, the breakout um, into, you know, that sweeping attack to to encircle the Ruhr. So we're starting off talking about the paratroopers because they were coming in first, but the guys that had the vital um, mission, in my opinion, were the glider infantry units, both for the British up there in LZO and LZU, and then um, the 194th glider infantry on the 17th side coming in in landing zone S, because those guys, those glider infantry guys, were really the ones that had the biggest mission to seize those bridges and to get to them while they were intact, right? And so, um, and then the British, to your point, JD had the 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 two German divisions that were being held in reserve um, were up near the British sector, and so they were gonna, you know, their mission again was to, and this is where the remaining German tanks um, were up with the um, 17th Panzer Grenadier Division and the 116th Panzer Division. Um, and the British were kind of responsible for preventing them from coming across those bridges and seizing okay. the, the the bridgehead. And then this, I think, is another great photo to, for us to pause on because it really starts to show just the how the capacity of the Allied Army has really changed at this point. Where you know, in Bar City and even in Market Garden, they're really scrambling, uh, scraping together as many aircraft as they can. This is a photo of just one airfield. Um, of 12 that was used to support, support Operation Varsity. Uh, and they were able to pull over, together over 1,500 transport aircraft to pull over 1,300 gliders into um, the Varsity area. And so you can kind of see here uh, another unique aspect of, of Varsity, which is implied by this photo, is you can see that there are two gliders um, for every one C-47. If you kind of look at that C-47 yeah. in the middle, you can see the two gliders flanking it behind. And so in order to increase the airlift, and we talked about the comparison of Market Garden, in order to get this all in a single lift, C-47s were going to be towing um, two of the Waco gliders behind it as they went into Germany, um, which again would have been probably disastrous to try to do that at night. So I've, I've always been of the opinion uh, that, you know, if I was ever reading about, you know, D-Day or anything like that, that if I were in the airborne, like there's no way I'd want to jump out of a plane. I would, I would rather go in on, on a glider. Uh, and I had that opinion until I read your book. And then I thought, <laughs> forget it. I, I want to be crossing the river. I don't want to go in <laughs> either way. Right. Uh, the, I don't think people realize just how hazardous these gliders were. Uh when I was, I remember when I was reading your book, you know, you're talking about the, the gliders going in and in my mind, 
I always put, frame things up like if this were a movie, you know, what, what would it look like? Mm -hmm. In my mind, it was almost like a glider version of the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. Uh, I mean, it, it just it. It, it sounds it's it's way more dangerous and way more hazardous than I would have ever thought. What, what were some of the the things that the glider infantry are going up against, and some of the risks that they are facing that maybe the the airborne paratroopers are not? Yeah, it's a great question, and and I, I like your your kind of the visual way you're thinking about it because again, I think it's important to remember, you know, gliders aren't something that we're necessarily familiar with, um, certainly in you know today's arsenal gliders were used in world war ii as a way of kind of trying to you know give the airborne the ability to bring in heavier equipment so you could put in you know the american version of the glider you could put a jeep in or you could put in um a, a 75 millimeter howitzer um they had also figured out how to a cut down i think it was a 105 millimeter howitzer that you could get in the back of one of those um, gliders from an infantry perspective it had the advantage of bringing in basically a squad size element and landing them all in the same place which is you know avoids the dispersion of an airdrop uh, but to your point jd you know it was it was very hazardous because you you you're, you're basically trying to land this engineless um glider into uh, a field right so you you know you you, you pick the best terrain that you can um, from a planning perspective, but you know, they're, they're normally farmers fields with have trees in them, fences in them. Right. And so it's a very hazardous landing. Um, a glider isn't necessarily something that's necessarily easy to uh, stall and stop once it kind of lands, you know, you, this is where uh, a, being a skilled pilot really comes into play. Um, this is a great photo showing one of the, the larger horse gliders that the British used um, that were made, I think, <laughs> I think it's fair to say almost completely out of wood. Um, the, um, they're, they're kind of like made out of balsa wood and t-shirts, aren't they? That's okay. right. That's right. Um, and the American versions at least had metal, you know, framing what to, to, to pop up the t-shirt basically, but it was the same kind of thing. They're made out of canvas and, and uh, aluminum frames. Yeah. And so there's just story after story of these things coming in and crashing, getting all tangled up. The first, serial coming in with the uh with the gliders for the 17th airborne the first two transport aircraft were shot down and of course you know you're being towed in on a glider so you know the glider pilots then have to quickly cut the tow rope early yeah. otherwise they're going to be pulled into the ground with the with the transport that's going down um and now as a glider pilot you find yourself you know at 800 feet being released from a transport aircraft um and in the case of the 17th airborne you know they're they're pulling in over 500 gliders um, wow. to land in this landing zone. And, you know, so it's just the pandemonium of, of all of that. Once these guys get on the ground, then you really have to pay attention because again, these gliders are coming into the landing zone and they don't make any noise. And so if you're not paying attention, you're going to get hit by one of these things as they come screaming in because the pilots don't have a tremendous amount of control to avoid obstacles on the ground once they're committed to landing. Well, I, I don't have any experience, of course, with flying a glider. I, I do have a lot of experience making paper airplanes. So, uh, and, and then making paper airplanes weight distribution is is mm -hmm. important. So, so I would think that would be another element with these. You know, especially if you're packing it with heavy equipment. That man, if you're even just a little bit off, once that thing gets in the air, like you, you could, be, or, or if it shifts in flight. Uh, you, you could be looking at some serious problems even before you get on the ground and start fighting. That's right. And one of the things that the glider guys were well versed on along with the glider pilots was that, that, that weight distribution. So there was lines on the inside of the glider where they kind of identified the center line and they were very keen on making sure that whatever equipment they had inside, whether it be a Jeep or artillery or medical supplies were all balanced as much as possible. The pilots would double check that. And then, and then, and, and then, to exactly your point, it's during flight, these guys were very paranoid to the point of paranoid to make sure that that flight, you know, that that, that load didn't shift um, because if it did, that created quite a huge problem for the pilots to try to keep that thing in the air with it, with the weight shifting around. All back to my point that I'd rather just come in on the ground and cross the river and boat <laughs> rather than, <laughs> rather than doing this. Uh, all right, let me bring up another one of your maps here. Um, if there's a certain one that you want me to go to, let me know. 
Yeah, yeah. let's. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the five hundred seventh. Why don't we jump up? Yeah, there we go. The five thirteenth. So this is this is the other interesting point of kind of comparison. We talked about Raf making his guys jump with radios. Mm -hmm. um, Coots, who was the commander, a guy named James Coots, who was the commander of the five thirteenth, did not do that. And so what ended up happening was um, his guys came in and actually landed. Um, up north there in the red dotted circle, the, the 513th mist, mist drop, um, they had actually landed almost a mile and a half, you know, north west of their drop zone, which was drop zone X. Um, the pilots coming in in their C-46s, there was a lot of ground haze from the artillery preparation that had gone into um, trying to, to knock out as many of the identified anti-aircraft positions as possible. Um, and so the pilots had a hard time recognizing ground features. Their navigation coming up to the Rhine was, was perfect. But as soon as they got to the Rhine and started coming in and descending down to their, you know, 600 feet to drop these guys in, they had a harder time recognizing um, the, the ground markers. And so the, the 513th was mis misdropped almost in mass to the north. Um, Coots had a hard time kind of organizing these guys because he didn't have radios. And so what they ended up doing kind of curiously, instead of going from their drop zone where they, where they landed to seize their objectives, they first all went to drop zone X where they were supposed to land and then went to their objectives from there once they had gotten organized, ah, okay. which caused a little bit of a delay um, in them seizing their objectives when you compare it to the 507th, right? Which mm -hmm. was able to kind of call an audible, if you will, and, okay. and reorganize on the fly. Um, it's interesting to note that the 466th Parachute Field Artillery Battalion, who was supposed to come in after the 513th had dropped, they landed on drop zone X as planned and ended up having to uh, fight as infantry for um, the first couple hours on the ground um, and in many cases, we're assembling their their 75 millimeter howitzers under fire and, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, essentially using them as shotguns, um, you know, aiming, aiming literally over the barrel, eyeballing it to take out German machine gun positions or fortified positions there on the drop zone. Wow. Uh, here's a question that, that just came in. Uh, so so this was their first and only jump during the war. Uh it, it, are there some things that I'm trying to think of how to phrase the question? Um, mm -hmm. Well, they say I wonder how much that played into the success. You, you mentioned that the the one group went to their drop zone first and then went to their their objectives. Uh, are, are there any things with some of the inexperience that's coming into play here, where they're kind of having to learn things for the first time, whereas you know other airborne units may have benefited from the experience that they had? Yeah, exactly. I think that's where, so the division itself, this was their first combat jump, but it was not the 507th's first combat jump. They yeah. had actually jumped into Normandy. And I think, again, that's where you see the difference in, you know, it's a shame that Raf was such a brash guy because he actually had a lot of good lessons learned that perhaps if he'd been able to present them in a more, uh, uh, you know, less hostile manner, yeah. James Coots of the 513th might have embraced that a little bit. Because again, I think one of the reasons why it took them longer to get organized was they had ignored the lessons that Raf had embraced around jumping with radios and, and how to kind of, um, you know, be more flexible once you realize the plan is never going to go as you think it is, right? And I think that's a lesson yeah. <laughs> that, that certainly all of history is, teaches us really good leadership lesson there as well, that you can be the smartest guy in the room and you can have the most experience and the best ideas. But if you don't present them in a way that is palatable people, you know, nobody's going to, to follow you. Uh, maybe another way of saying it is you, you can attract more flies with honey than vinegar. Uh, that's right. That's right. It's a great leadership example. Perfect. Dead on. Yeah. Um, and this map really shows um, the, the glider edge, echelon the 194th as they came into lzs um they really were responsible for seizing these bridges um so you can kind of see there the dark arrows was the the second battalion they were responsible for seizing bridges one through four the other guys up to the north they're responsible for seizing bridges five through ten um and there was you know some really heavy battles um, along these bridges particularly around bridge one and two that's right on the edge there of the main urban area mm -hmm. Uh, vessel there. 
Um, there were a couple of German Panther tanks trying to make their way across um, those bridges as the as the, the glider guys were actually fighting their way into the city to seize them. Um, some amazing bazooka work on behalf of the glider infantry guys along those bridges, keeping those tanks back. Um, you had uh, an interesting battle there marked on the map. Burp Gun Corner is uh, one of the more famous glider pilot battles um, where, you know, Miley kind of recognized that with the glider pilots, he had this opportunity to use these guys who were trained in ground combat. Um, I don't want to overemphasize that. I've heard sometimes that that they've been character they they went through ranger training and all this other kind yeah. of stuff. Um, to a glider pilot, it might have seemed like ranger training because it was condensed and intense, but it was not ranger training. It was you know basic infantry school stuff with how to use you know your M1 rifle, how to serve a, you know how to how to man a crew served weapon, and it was vital training for them. Um, and so Miley kind of recognized that he could use these glider pilots inside his perimeter to set up blocking positions or to guard POWs to free up his infantry to go take on the bigger tasks. Yeah, and then and then this one kind of shows um, the the value of of varsity. I, you know, there's always conversations around was it necessary to you know varsity was so close to the end of the war. Um, I think it's worth pausing on this before we go into it to talk a little bit sure. about the end of the war. And, yeah. and a stat I think that's always important to remember is, um, I want to say in April of 1945, the last full month of the war, the Americans suffered as many killed in action as they did in June of 1944. And I think that wow. was 10,000 wow. 10, men killed that month, I think, if I've got the number right. Well, as the Americans and the British and Canadians are, well, as the allies uh, are are getting closer to home for the Germans, it's only natural that they're going to fight harder and, you know, maybe with a little bit more desperation. That's right. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things that I found interesting that I had not come to naturally, but it was interesting to think, the other thing to think about in that equation, JD, is that the further you're pushing them into Germany, the reduced supply lines that the Germans yeah. have. So, you know, they, they don't have as much men and, and, you know, certainly fuel as they did in earlier years of the war, but they've got a lot less further distance to cover to get what they do have where they need it. And so, you know, varsity was expected by the Germans. And so they had started pulling anti-aircraft guns from everywhere that they could to bolster the, the expected area of the landing and because they didn't, you know, and it was easier for them to do it at that point of the war because they didn't have that far to go with it. Yeah, if I remember right, I think I remember reading a portion in your book where one of the C-47 pilots who had flown prior missions said it was the worst flak that he had, that he had gone through. Yeah, that's right. So they had, you know, there was a lot of um, allied uh, intelligence failures before varsity. If you pull up, by the way, there's a photo of just the one guy sitting in the plane. He's got a grease gun across his reserve parachute. I don't know if you've got that readily available, but what I what I love about this photo is, um, you know, if you know what this guy knows, so this guy's sitting in the back of a C-46. He's probably, what, 18, 19 years old? He looks 12. <clears throat> yeah, he looks 12. <laughs> you know, what you have to understand about what this guy knows is that on March 23rd, you know, the same day that we're having this talk back in 1945 in the in the camps that these guys were doing their map studies, packing their equipment, getting ready. They had mounted on, on telephone poles in the camp. They had, you know, loudspeakers and they were playing mm -hmm. uh, German radio on these speakers. Right. Because GIs tended to like German radio better than allied radio, which. <laughs> um, but while these guys are packing their equipment and loading them, you know, their magazines for their weapons, Axis Sally announces that she knows that the 17th Airborne Division is going to jump into Germany the next day. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and so, you know, I think you can appreciate the look on this guy's face a little bit more when you when you understand that, you know, the element of surprise is non-existent for these guys right now. They, that the Germans know that Montgomery is going to use airborne operations. Um, there was a very questionable press release made by Bradley, actually, the day before as well. You know, Patton had made his famous crossing of the Rhine River at Remagen. And, you know, Bradley and Patton kind of had this infamous 
rivalry with Montgomery. And so they released a press release saying something like, without the benefit of artillery preparation, without the benefit of smoke, and without the benefit of airdrops, we cross the Rhine River. Well, artillery prep, smoke prep, and airdrop was exactly how Montgomery was going to get across the Rhine River. And so, you know, you could make an argument that in addition to all the other intelligence that the Germans had gathered to kind of, you know, figure out that this airdrop was going to happen, Bradley's poorly worded press release confirmed if you read between the lines that Montgomery was going to use all of those things in his imminent crossing of the Rhine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so just find the place where there's a lot of smoke and artillery <laughs> firing off and then <laughs> there's going to be an airdrop coming right behind it. Yeah. That's that, right. Yeah. You got it sorted out. Yeah. Serious misstep on, on Bradley's part. Uh, c- Cause yeah, like you said, Patton kind of goaded him into doing that, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then you had, you know, and then Eisenhower the same day released a press release to the Axis reminding them that killing paratroopers uh, was a war crime. <laughs> so it's kind of like, well, let's just, let's, you know, but now again, it, the high command knew at this point also because of intercepted Enigma stuff that uh, the high command knew that the Germans knew. The high, you know, the Allied high command, of course, wasn't going to let the 17th know that they knew, yeah. but, um, you know, which is the their lot in life, unfortunately, but but they knew because of Axis Sally. So, so here's a, a few then and now photos that you that you took while while you were there. What what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is uh, I, I'm glad you brought this up. This is my uh, tribute to what you have nailed so perfectly on your channel, and it, it does such an amazing job on that. I'm a huge fan of your work, but this was uh, this is my attempt to kind of in uh, the, the like 2010, 2012 timeframe, do my own kind of comparison of then and now. And so uh, the one on the left there, this is uh, right by um, uh, Burp Gun Corner, that, that glider pilot battle that we talked about. So this is, uh, that, that top photo there is a glider pilot kind of um, standing there. All those troops behind him are German POWs being marched back towards the Rhine. And of course, you compare those two photos there, you can see that the roof lines are pretty identical. Um, so that was the, um, I, Jim, I know Jim, good to see you. Um, this was kind of the area where um, the glider pilots fought that battle. The the Stug that came up and attacked their position came up that road there um, where my back is to that. And then um, on the right side is um, just pivoting to the right of that first picture is this this intersection. Um, I'm kind of standing by that road sign that's on the right hand side. And this was a position where um, some glider troopers had set up a 30 caliber machine gun position to support the glider um, pilots that were um, set up there in that roadblock position. So this was um, yeah, okay, let's get, let's keep going. This was uh, this was that Stug that was knocked out a little bit further in town. You can kind of see the the Kubelwagen there on the right. Yeah. The Stug knocked out on the left. This is two photos of the same incident, just kind of reversed from from where they took place. Um, and you know, you can you can speak to this a lot better than I can. But just the the satisfaction and the um, you know the the, the hide and seek game of trying to match up these locations is very rewarding once you actually get it done. Right. And so this was, uh, this was that effort there of me kind of walking around. A lot of Germans are staring at me as I'm standing there trying to figure out where I am. If this is the right roof line, you know, the deal there. Yeah. At least you weren't walking around pointing a camera at yourself like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then you really get people looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so kind of, summing up some some stuff with with varsity i mean this is I, would you, this is a this is a wildly successful operation uh it's it's an airborne jump into the heart of the reich uh how, how has this kind of been lost in the cracks of history yeah it's a it's a great question. I think part of it, you know, and I think there's a number of ways that have to you have to answer that question. I think one, um, it was predominantly a British operation, right? It was led by Montgomery. Um, the first u- units across the Rhine River themselves were were largely British units. Um, the British Six Airborne had participated in it, um, so that's one aspect of it, right? It was just kind of overshadowed by what Montgomery was doing. 
um, th there's then there's a there's a couple of assumptions that have gone into it that I think are incorrect. Right. One is is like, well, Patton had already crossed the Rhine at Remagen. So crossing uh, further up where Montgomery was was unnecessary, which is completely incorrect because you've yeah. got the whole breakout to encircle the Ruhr there that was vital to the Allied strategy. Um, and then you just have a lot of bad information out there or assumptions around the state of the German army at that point. Again, they were nowhere near their high watermark, but they were still lethal to infantry on the ground. And so, you know, one historian I read actually gaffed it so bad. He said that the 17th Airborne had more jump injuries landing in Germany than they did combat casualties, which is just uh, an, a completely ignorant thing to to. to it just shows you didn't even look at it, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the the 17th did suffer 1,300 casualties in forcing that, that uh, the Rhine opening, so to speak. They had 430 of those guys were killed in action. Um, this photo here of Jim, Jim Conboy, he, he used to refer to it as the last photo of his right foot because... Um, at the end of that day of March 24th, he had actually lost his right foot to oh, a, uh, either a, a, either a landmine or a German grenade. He was never quite sure what actually shredded his right leg. Um, and full confession, this photo is probably what's responsible for me enlisting and wanting to become a paratrooper. I just uh, I just think this is one of the most badass pictures of a it paratrooper is. from the war. Um so in my, I'm, I'm jealous of this guy that I don't look this tough. I know, right? I mean, he's got the, he's got the you know kind of the mohawk going. He was a demolitions guy in the 513th. Um, photo taken by the famous Robert Kappa, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's one element. There's so many things that that we could talk about. And one element is that Robert Kappa, the famous photographer from D-Day, who gave us the photo Jaws of Death, is right along on on this mission. Uh, he he jumped in with him, didn't he? That's right. Yeah, he jumped yeah. with the five thirteenth. Um, he he jumped from a C forty six, and uh, quickly found out, like, like your supposition that he should not have jumped in <laughs> because because he did not enjoy his first moments on the ground under under German fire. That's for sure. Well, I uh, we, we've been at it for about an hour here, man. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and and telling us a, a little bit about Operation Varsity here on the the eve of the the anniversary. Um, and for anybody who's watching or, or listening, there's so much about this operation that we didn't talk about. We, we barely skimmed the surface and this book right here, I would definitely encourage you to go out and get, uh, because it's going to tell you so much more about operation varsity and the 17th airborne. And, uh, you also have another book that I want you to come back on at some point and talk about. And that's Angels Against the Sun, talking about the 11th Airborne, which probably I would say is equally obscure as the 17th. Um, my childhood doctor, just as a little side note, we'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of 11th Airborne stuff here. Uh, he was a, a child of missionaries during World War II and was at Los Banos. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So... Uh, so I was I was really into that book as well. But uh, man, I, I appreciate the the work that you've done and uh, for diving into this and, and sharing history with people. Uh, any last things you want to kick out there before we go? Uh, I just want to thank you, JD, for for hosting this session. It's a great day to be talking about Operation Varsity on the on the eve of the anniversary of it. I'm a huge fan of your work, and uh, it's it's a, been a pleasure and an honor for me to to be here with you. So I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up there uh, again. Hey, as soon as this stream ends, I would highly encourage you to go to Amazon or anywhere where you buy books and uh, pick up four hours of fury. It's it's an outstanding work and uh, we'll hope to uh, broaden your understanding of World War Two and the contributions of the 17th Airborne and Operation Varsity and uh, the overall things that the allies did towards the end of the war. All right. Well, we are going to go ahead and wrap it up there. Thanks for joining us.